Hey there, neighbors and naysayers. Clint Finney again, another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council web update. This is part two of establishing and maintaining pasture diversity with our good friend Bob Hendershot from the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council winter meeting held January 27th, 2022 in Caddis, Ohio. Enjoy. Things you need to do. Forage it. Look at your forages. Monitor what's going on out there. What's the color of the grass? What color should it be? Yellow? Light green? It should be a deep dark green. What is that color we're looking at? Chlorophyll. Chlorophyll. If it's dark green, then we have a high density of chlorophyll. The more chlorophyll you have in that plant, the more sunlight it's going to collect, the more energy it's going to make. What do your animals need? Energy. And they get it from the plant through the sun, <clears throat> through that chlorophyll. How dense is that pasture field? One of the things I laid over there, some of you have picked up, had two things. One is the pasture condition score, you guide. And then this one from ARS on diversity as well for you to read. But look at density. You remember doing that? It's been a while. <laughs> This, just having a, a transect where we can, this is just a simple one, we, we if you were in Western Ohio, we used these to measure red corn residue in a crop field, or soybean residue. It has points. We call this a line point transect, because these little orange dots are the point. So you just look at one point, and you count what's there. There's a hundred points on this. It's 50 feet long. A point every hundred or every half foot. So there's a hundred. It makes math real easy. These percentages are based on a hundred, right? You find ten spots with a corner piece of you have ten percent residue. If you find ten clover plants at that point, you have ten percent clover. Not really. Clover <laughs> by weight only nine percent. It's ninety percent, so ten is actually nine. So as we count, it's an easy way to keep track of your diversity across the field. Stretch that out, look at each point, have a pad, that probably uses a <laughs> And you just mark the tall fescue, and you just click the X's or make a mark, and when you get all done, you can total up what the percentage is of your field of the different species. One of the things you may have heard me say is, you cannot manage what you do not measure. If you're not measuring it, you don't have a clue. You can eyeball it and maybe get close. But unless you're measuring it, you really don't know. I bet the bank knows exactly how much money you have in your account. Because they measure it daily. My bank <coughs> Every month they send me a daily, what my balance was on a daily rate. So they're measuring my account every day. I don't measure my pasture fields that often. But I do know what the percentages are of the different species out there. The other way, remember this too, mm -hmm. is our, uh, you can just throw this in a pasture field, random, with many places. If you just look at a pasture field, your eyes go everywhere. It's like when you were a young man and you went to the beach and the flies kind of everywhere. <laughs> that was rough. It was rough. <laughs> See, this focuses you on one spot, right? So you get to look at one spot and then you can get down and then you can look at the species within this given area. So then you can count individual species. How many clover plants, how many pesky plants. How many bluegrass plants? How many poverty grass plants? How many briars? This is. So, either way it works, but you gotta. I like the, the transect because it keeps me moving. I'm an old man, I gotta keep moving. If I've been down too many times, I don't get back up and move. So. <coughs> so, look at that. That's how we measure the diversity and the density. Then you also look, part of that density is how much bare soil is there. 
happens every now and then, you'll hit a point and there's nothing but dirt. Do you want that? I want the sunshine to hit a green chlorophyll cell. Every single, every ray of sunshine should hit a chlorophyll patch or a cell. So it's diverse. Then regrowth. How many of you walk past your pasture fields three days after you move the animals out? A week after you move the animals out? Or you're too busy looking at what's ahead to go back and evaluate what happened? And look at what's growing. What plants are coming back the fastest? What were the conditions? Did you get a rain? Did you get a frost? And what plants are surviving your management style? How short did you graze it? How tall? How much residue did you leave? And look at the regrowth response and what's going on in your pasture field. It's called some of those management. Look at your livestock. Now this is easier for most of you. I find most people, most guys, probably gals too. I know Beth has her cows all named. I don't name them. Well, some of my cows not have all. names, but not. Some of them are just numbers. <laughs> some of them aren't nice names. <laughs> but look at the manure consistency. Is, does it stack up? Or is it running out? If you're feeding hay right now, what kind of quality is the hay? You can tell by what's coming out of the back of the cow and how, what she's looking like. My growing animals, my growing steers and heifers, their manure still splats on the quality of the hay that they're getting. So that tells me there's not much fiber in there. There's probably enough. Some days I wish it'd be a little more, maybe. That means they're growing, though. If that flops when it hits the ground and stands up and it stumbles over, or if you drive over a frozen one and it shakes the tractor, you probably have too much fiber in that diet, even for an old cow. <coughs> so that the manure and consistency, I also look at distribution. Right now is probably when you should be managing your nutrient management plan of your cows. How are they distributing their manure across the pasture field? Are they distributing it? And that's one of the things I like about grazing right now. I, I'm bell grazing. So they get grass and hay as they move through the fields right now. But the manure is, I have a cow pie about every square yard. It's very uniform. I don't know if I have a picture in this one or not. I took pictures and showed somebody. The body condition and their health. Now has been tough. They, how many calories did they burn last night? A lot. Fortunately, they were dry coats. But it was chilly. What gives them more heat? Grain or hay? Or forage. Forage. Forage will generate more body heat than grain. So you want to make sure they get enough to eat. Your belly's full when they lay down for the night. It's too late now because they've already laid down, guys, but the night before. So you want them to at least hold, hold, hold even. And checking their body condition as they've gone through. Measured indicators. The rest periods, day length. How, are you monitoring these? What's your rest period? What's your grazing period? Grazing period is how long the animals are in a given spot. Do you have goals on what they should be? Do you have absolute goals that they will never be here more than four days? Okay. When I travel, I, to, I leave minimum goals for my, my daughter and son-in-law granddaughter to manage. I said, I don't care what you do, but at least every four days they got to have new grass. Because I know they, they don't always look at the pastures the same way I do. Do you know how much grass you have when you turn them in and how much you have when you leave? 
That has changed in my career. I now leave more residual behind me than I did before. When we first started this, I hate to think how long ago, 40 years ago, we talked about grazing it pretty short, the New Zealand style. They were in an environment they could get away with that. They were grazing ryegrass. They would graze it from four to two inches. High quality feed. We can't do that. We don't have that kind of resilience in our soils and in our climate. There every day is about the same. Temperature doesn't vary much more than 20 degrees. From the coldest to the hottest. So it's very, they get grass growth all day, all year long. If we don't have that, we have to give something back to maintain that system. Uh, percent of ground cover and species diversity. Are you monitoring? That's why we measure. One of the things I've been is measuring, make sure I have the diversity I want, or striving for, or keep that diversity. If you don't have at least 10% of anything, it's the, you don't have any of that. So if I only have 9% clover out there, that's basically nothing. That's not doing anything for me. I gotta be at least 15 to 20% before it has an impact into the grazing system or the ecosystem. Now, there for the longest time when we were looking at uh, measuring, measuring indicators, we were trying to find a dry matter per acre. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't know if a good way to do that with this taller grass grazing. So you're saying you're pretty much just looking at that height in and height out rather than worrying about dry matter. Well, I measure, I'm still using the, I use a rising plate meter still. But on that really tall grass, I mean, is there, does that work? No, okay. not in terms of my coming in height. Right. No. It does work on when I leave. My goal is to leave 16 to 1800 pounds okay. of dry matter in the field when the cows walk away, okay? And that changes. During the spring of the year, that is growing. We start at 1,200 and move up to 18, sometimes we'll leave at 2,400 pounds. My goal is to, yeah, remember that growth group? I keep it, trying to push it through the summer. So when I come into July, I have some oh, stockpile of that spring growth that I've managed in my height. The summertime, we tend to graze it down a little bit, more down to that 1,600 pounds I'm trying to leave. All part of that is if we graze it too short, we start getting sunshine or sun heat penetrating into the soil. And we don't want to raise the soil temperature. And the other thing, I, if you really, really want to get into it, you're a third level manager, you'd be measuring soil's temperature at an inch depth. What should it be? You try to never let it get over 90 degrees. If it gets much over 90, then you start losing soil life. You start cooking, you start dying. And we start losing moisture. So remember what I, my first question to you? What's your number one thing that restricts your growth? Moisture. And if I can keep that taller during the summer months, I'm shading it, keeping that soil cooler. A cool, shaded soil is going to maintain more pasture. I get less evapotranspiration. Moisture leaving the soil by evaporation. I want it. They're going to. If they're going to leave my farm, I want it to leave through the plants and not through just evaporating off. I don't want my neighbors to get my soil moisture in the form of rain. I'd rather take theirs. Uh, so it influences nutrient cycling. And the reason that is because the plants use different nutrients different times of the year. Do a, does a clover plant need much nitrogen if it's fully inoculated? No. The grasses will utilize more of that. So the more diversity I have out there, 
they'll use more of the different nutrients. The deeper ones will pull nutrients up from deeper in the soil. Another reason I maintain a taller pasture, because the taller plant, regardless of the species, will have deeper roots. So the deeper my roots, the more soil I can ex explore, or the plants can explore to pull moisture and nutrients out of it. Plant diversity is lowest on the most productive soils. So if you have really, really good productive soil, 250 bushel corn soils, it's going to be real hard to maintain diversity because the most productive plants will always have an advantage. It works well on some of our pasture fields because we usually don't have this. So some of the dairy farmers I work with that have our dairy grazers, if you will, have some real hard time getting diversity and maintaining it. They're constantly having to reseed things in. And that's what you do with New Zealand. They're constantly seeding. Every year they're putting new seed on the pasture fields because they can't maintain enough diversity out there because their soils are so productive. Rotational grazing helps manage diversity because as we turn the animals in there, does your cow eat the same thing every day? Does she have different nutritional demands? Yeah. That day she freshens, or after she freshens, she has a totally different demand than she did back when she was six, six months pregnant. So she has totally different demands. And she's going to be seeking to meet those demands if she has the choice to make selectivity. So throughout the grazing season, she's going to choose different plants. The calves are going to choose different plants. So it makes a difference in how we manage. If you manage, how many of you manage your rotation? And by that I mean, do you graze in the same spot every year in terms of where you start? Do you winter your cows in the same area every year? Or are you mixing it up? Instead of starting in paddock one, you start in paddock seven. Most of us get in a routine where we just go around paddock to paddock because that's the sequence they're in. Maybe the way it was designed. But we ought to be able to have the flexibility to move over there to over here to over there. Now that takes more time on your job of managing. You spend more time probably moving animals. On my farm, one of the reasons I got into the beef cattle business besides easier to sell beef from lamb is the fact that they're two different species. I bought cows because they're great worm eaters for my sheep. They eat the parasites. So we switch pasture. So half the year the cattle are grazing here and the sheep over here. The next half they're over here. The next year the sheep will start over here and the cattle will over here. So we try not to start and graze the same way every year. That allows our pastures to get more diverse. If you do it the same way year after year after year, you're favoring some plants and hurting other plants, groups of plants. So you want to try and change that up to give every plant a fair shake and maintain that diversity. That makes sense what you're trying to do so change that rotation every year change where you rotate or years ago when I helped you all design grazing I always thought you have a ought to have three to four different wintering areas and rotate every month during the winter months and you shouldn't rotate in the same order you should that paddock that you're in in December shouldn't be the same one every every December so you can mix them up a little bit. <coughs> Roots is important. How many of you have plants that go down this deep? How many have soils that let them go down? <laughs> Growing deep roots is important, part of that diversity, and maintaining that diversity. Because those biologically active soils give us soil strength, that tilth and aggregation. 
There's a lot of talk about mud. And I think we can improve mud situation by improving our soil, giving it more strength, by allowing those roots to be in there. Because that this soil is stronger than a soil that doesn't have good soil strength, if you will, or good soil tilth. Soil in higher organic matter is going to be stronger than the soil in low organic matter. Okay. That's one of the things <coughs> I look for across my pasture. I don't have much mud problem. I, I take great pride in that. I'm a soils guy, so I think I've done a real good job building the strength in my soil by managing it in a way that it holds the cows up. And I don't over, try never to overgraze, so I can maintain that soil structure. If I overgraze, that's going to cause you to have mud, because you've taken away the organic matter. How does the organic matter get into the soil? Do you know? Cows poop it on? It comes from the roots. If you're not growing enough roots, you're not growing enough organic matter. I've monitored a lot of pastures through the years, still do, where guys still aren't growing any organic matter in their soils, pasture soils. They've been in grass for their whole lifetime, and the organic matter still one and a half percent. But they graze them too short. They never get enough root mass in that soil to build organic matter. One of your goals should be to build organic matter. If you sample your soil for nothing more than organic matter content, it would be worth it to you to see how good you're doing. Do you have a goal of building organic matter in your pasture soils? Five, 10, 15 years. If I build organic matter, you'll build better water holding capacity, and I can grow more grass. Remember, water is my limitation. Healthier plants. We have more available nutrients, photohormones. You know plants have hormones? You'll be learning this as your kids get older. Hormones will invade your house someday. As they get older. I have great fun now being a grandparent, watching my children become parents. And as the grandkids get to be teenagers, it's a lot more fun <laughs> to be a grandparent seeing that than to be the dad of a house full of girls. And fewer pathogens. Because a healthy soil has more healthy organisms than sick organisms. You know, we can talk about COVID. If you're going to get sick with COVID, what, one of the things we, they talk about is those with underlying health issues. They're already got something wrong with their health. Same thing with the soil. If you have a problem in the soil, you're going to get pathogens. What, what do insects attack first? The healthy plants or the sick plant? The sick plant. That plant is sick because the soil is sick. So you got to start the problem building a healthy soil. <coughs> Manage with more, is it by disturbing less? Don't overgraze. Diversity is critical in this process of maintaining enough diversity in terms of plants. But I also encourage you cow guys to think about getting other species of animals to graze. You know, goats, sheep. Something else out there, because they'll eat other things in that community, that plant community as well. Feed your livestock, your soil livestock, with living roots. Just like that rhizobia bacteria, the source of all the energy in the soil comes from the sun through the plant. Those plant roots are leaking out sugar water to feed the microorganisms. Okay, A healthy growing plant flourishes by leaking out more sugar water. So the more sugar water energy you can release into the soil, the more bacteria and fungi it can support, 
and it makes it even more healthy, if you will. But it starts with the manager on top. You got to make those decisions to see that that happens. And keep it coming. <coughs> Toxic fescue is one of those things that we try to look at. The Alliance for Grassroot and Renewal. It's not in Ohio yet. I keep trying to get them to come over here. But Kentucky, Missouri, Tennessee now. Iowa started in Iowa. The whole goal of this was to reduce my old friend. Uh, from Iowa, said Steve Wallace, he wanted to eliminate Kentucky 31. He thought there ought to be a national program just to do away with it, get rid of it. Because there's a lot of toxics. We look at it, the animals are, but if it, there's also the toxin also, the uh, ergoflavins also affect the soil life. And it's, that's why the tall fescue pastures stay tall fescue pastures. They're exuding the toxin into the soil as well, killing off mycorrhizae that other plants need to grow. So it's a toxic relationship that they have. So I want you to be aware of that. In some of those states, their equip program is based on this. There it will assist farmers and eliminating Kentucky 31 from their farms. So. Why is it important? Because some of the Indian, these are, this is a uh, novel tall fescue, if you will. This is some of the newer ones. Here's Kentucky 31. It's four points, four percentage points better in the uh, digestibility, if you will. It makes a big difference. You remember this name? Tried to find it. That was an endophyte free variety. I mean, it was a good thing it didn't survive because the digestibility is terrible. <coughs> Body weight, why it was a good thing to make the change is the fact that we can get 200 pounds more gain on a per acre basis. Forage yields, it lasts. So some of these newer ones, or the, the novel endophyte fescues, are just as productive, if not more productive, than the 31. Multi-species grazing, I talked a little bit about that, potential to restore ecosystems. <coughs> One of the things I've been working with in the last few years is targeted grazing. It's where we are using sheep and goats to manage difficult landscape situations. Leafy spurge and the Dakota. Using them to manage brush in the, in the northeastern states. Using them for fire control in the western states, around cities and uh, population centers, to graze the fuel load out so we won't have the fires that we've had in the past. But uh, these are grazing the junipers. And then some of the things we can plug in there are some of the turnips. Summer annuals, warm season summer annuals, pearl millet, sorghum sedan grass. This has been raised out. And we're ready to move on. You can get multiple grazings. So some of that diversity we can get into a pasture field or into a grazing system that works. This is oats from the fall of the year, planted after wheat and planted in the first week of August. And we turn the cows out there, and uh, one acre will support one cow for the whole winter. So we've done this years after years here in central Ohio, uh, and then down in Fairfield County. I think of my name somewhere. This is uh, my yearlings grazing in uh, sorghum sedan grass, the BMR sorghum sedan grass. So they'll go in there and graze it. I weighed these guys. They were, for 100 days, we grazed this uh, sorghum sedan grass. And they averaged four pounds a day. A group of 10, 10 of them that I weighed, turned out, weighed, or weighed, turned out, brought them back in after 100 days of grazing. 
they put on 400 pounds. Four pounds a day, crazy. I give Flu Hardy a hard time all the time on the feed now. That's not feedlot. They weren't getting anything but what was out there. That's pretty good. Right. The warm season perennials, we stock at a very high rate for, a, again, for those four days. <clears throat> and they'll do very, very well as well. Again, that's a, those native warm seasons have a very peak growth period for four months in the summertime. You don't get much in the spring, you don't get much in the fall. So you got to manage your diversity is more on a farm basis than it is in a field. So I keep trying to find different things that will fit in these environments. Bale grazing, this is what we're doing now. This is what it looks like. Oop, there's my picture. There you can see the cow eyes. We're moving through the field. I found that amazing how uniformly they distribute those pies across the field. So the <coughs> managed grazing creates a healthy pasture with diversity and a good, thick, deep root system that will hold the soil. And we end up with this. Where's my water quality, water safety? There. Which one do you want to see? <laughs> All ones. <laughs> this one over here, right? Yes. Because we want to keep that soil in place and our water clean. So I'll stop there. Any other questions? Did I go to the Oh, perfect. Questions? No? Right. Hope you have a great new green. <laughs> As soon as the snow goes, will the grass green up and start growing, right? Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Thanks for listening to Establishing and Maintaining Pasture Diversity with Bob Hendershot. Hope you enjoyed the video and hope you check out some of our other videos here on our YouTube channel. If not, also, we hope to see you at a future Eastern Ohio Grazing Council event. With that, I'll say we'll see you next time.